Resilience. Okay. Hard work. Never give up. What's your opinion on NFTs? Honestly. Honestly. So what would you recommend for the younger generation that are trying to save a deposit? Great numbers. We love those numbers. Those numbers are good numbers. <laughs> so, you know, I haven't told anybody yet, to be honest with you. So maybe we'll have to edit this out. Yeah. You're <laughs> not, lo you're lo not lo older than you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more knowledge. Sorry, so welcome back to my podcast. I'm Adam Abraham. And today we have my friend and business advisor of some sort here, Charles mm -hmm. Knott. Hi, Adam. Pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I've always wanted you on my podcast and we're finally here. It's 2023. We're going to talk about some business today. We're going to start off with some questions I normally ask everybody, which I'm going to mm -hmm. ask everybody. We're going to start off with childhood. Yep. Um, so tell everybody, tell the viewers about yourself um, and what it was like growing up and where you grew up and, and yeah, how it was really. Okay, so I had um, quite an interesting upbringing. So I was born in London, but uh, I also spent quite a lot of time in Spain because my mother is Spanish, my father is English. So both my sister and I spent our education between London and Madrid. Um, when we were 11, we spent five years at a boarding school in Madrid, which was initially quite daunting, but then it then ended up being quite fun. Um, both my parents had decided that um, that was the best place for us to continue our education because my father was an engineer and he was going to be doing a quite a long-term project in Kenya. So rather than continue our education in Kenya, they decided that it was best that we went to boarding school in Madrid. So we ended up going to King's College, which is an English school, and it was good fun. We enjoyed it. So we were there from the ages of 11 until 16 and then came back to London to finish off our education and that was that was yeah that was the education part so charles talk about kenya why did you go kenya what was the reason for your father moving to kenya well my father was an engineer and he was involved in various projects from uh, bridge construction essentially so it was a long-term project and it was their decision that um well they felt quite strongly my mother felt quite strongly that both my sister and i should spend uh, time in madrid where we had family rather than being in Kenya. So, but you know, we went there often enough, so we enjoyed it. I've since been back, I've been to Mombasa, I did a safari, so, and went to a wedding as well. So it's a, it's a great country, I liked it. Yeah, your father's business is in Kenya. What did he do um, and sort of like, did it influence where you are today? None whatsoever. None, because <laughs> he was- <laughs> <laughs> Complete opposite to me. <laughs> Complete opposite, so he was an, he was an engineer, um, so he was basically in Kenya uh, designing and building bridges and therefore taking control of those projects. Also some dam construction. So I, you know, as much as he tried to get me interested in, in what he was doing, for me it was a non-starter. Okay. It was not something I thought, no, this is for me. No, it's not for me. <laughs> it's good you knew it wasn't for you. So that's Correct. a great start yeah. to your career. And tell us what you did um, after you sort of left your education at private school. What was your first job or did you work while she was in private school? Um, I didn't work. I mean, when I was back in London, I, I did some, you know, typical Saturday jobs that you okay. at the time. So I was working at, at a news agent, okay. which was okay. So it was an early start in the morning. Um, I then did another Saturday job after that one, which was working at a menswear shop. Okay. Uh, that was just a, a little private local shop. Um, so I spent Saturday just to, you know, earn that extra bit of money. Makes sense. Um, and then once education was completed, I was in a little bit of a situation where, what do I want to do? So I spoke Spanish fluently. Okay. I knew I wanted to use the language because I thought it was useful to have that, that qualification and being able to speak fluently. And my mother just suggested, Go and work for a bank. Wow. Okay. So I, really, I have no idea why she made that suggestion. So I thought, well, I've got to do something. I've just been doing nothing all day. So I thought, well, let's give it a try. So I applied. Um, I got into working for a Spanish bank. And from there, that's the stepping stone of my career in financial services, which I look back and I don't regret. I'm, I'm glad I took that step. Good. So did you have to study to sort of be in the position you are today after applying for the job or... Or like, as in, what's the steps to sort of get into what you got into? Yeah, back in those days, it was encouraged that you did the exams to become a member of the Institute of Bankers. Okay. So that was um, that's something I did. Um, but then it's essentially, it's working hard, showing that you really want to progress and go through the various areas of banking that, you know, they will put you in and learn as much as you can and hopefully be able to climb the ladder. And what field do you specialize in? 
back then um i was covering many things so the basics of banking that we know today so that's essentially sort of retail banking okay because i think it's important to learn everything right it's not just a case of leapfrogging and going into the more glamorous side of banking but i think it's important to learn everything from the basics so i did that for the first few years um and then entered into the world of private banking okay which i found very glamorous so that i enjoyed a lot because you were dealing with a unique breed of people you know high net worth ultra high net worth individuals very demanding okay um some self-made some inherited and you know they were all very different but they all had one thing in common they all spoke spanish oh wow okay so these were um, self-made entrepreneurs in latin america and that's why i spent two years in mexico city and what sort of net worth are we talking about we're talking significant in, in well in terms of numbers people love numbers on my channel they want to hear the numbers <laughs> So if nine figures means anything, otherwise we're talking sort of in the hundred million. Okay. Hundred million. So very successful. And from there. Good. Okay. Great numbers. We love those numbers. Those numbers are good numbers. <laughs> and what's interesting that there was um, you know, there was one particular guy that I really admired who was already quite sort of advanced in life. He was in his sort of late sixties, and this was back then in the late eighties. Um, he had escaped Spain after the Spanish Civil War. Okay. Arrived in Mexico with nothing hmm. and he built up a very successful paper processing business and he just made a huge amount of money so he was on that point ready to pass the reins over to his children his, his children have become very well educated in the u.s have gone to ivy league schools wow. and they were clearly far more advanced than he was in terms of risk and making investments so whereby the father was sort of very risk conscious and risk adverse they were saying no right I hear all these things about derivatives and I want to do derivatives, I want to do this, I want to do that. So clearly far more adventurous and wanting to make their money work. Of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, everyone has a different business model. Exactly. Um, some of us are riskier than others. Yeah, but, but it's very typical of, of that sort of generation where you sort of look at the older generation who are more risk adverse, but then you get the more younger generation who are more informed, who read a lot, who understand these more sophisticated investment products and they want to give it a try. So let's go into, let's talk about now when you started your first job in the bank. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. What was that like for you? As in like, what did you learn? Who did you meet? Was it great for your career? How, what was the pay like? Well, I got um, I got used to having to wear a suit every day. Okay, in those days, that's nice. <laughs> you had to wear a suit <laughs> and you had to wear a tie. Where today, you know, the more sort of casual approach to the dress code is, is nowhere near what it was back then. So they, it was very formal. You even had to wear your jacket. Oh wow! At the desk. Okay. So that's how strict it was. But that's the you know the, the tradition of what it was back then. So it was daunting. Um, initially, in the first six months, I wasn't sure whether I, I had made the right decision. And then one day there was a turning point, and the manager of the bank called me into his office, and he said to me, "Charles, how long have you been here now?" So I said, mm, "I think it's about seven months." He said, "Okay." Are you sure this is the right career for you? Wow. And something triggered inside me. I thought, I'm not accepting this. <laughs> <laughs> a challenge. <laughs> it was the challenge. Right? Okay. And I don't know whether he was, to this day, I don't know whether he meant it to be a challenge for me to see how <laughs> I, I would react, or he was serious. Okay. And I thought, no, I'm going to take this on. <laughs> Even if I hate coming in here, I'm going to take this on. I'm going to prove him wrong. And that was quite a significant turning point for me. Hmm. Because, you know, I wouldn't call him a mentor, but just that question alone was worth a lot in terms of how I reacted to it. So I'll consider that a kick up the bum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Charles, wake up can, call. yeah, wake up. <laughs> that was the wake up call. But of course, how you deal with the wake up call very much depends on who you are of and course. your own resilience and how proud you are about, well, I'm going to prove this guy wrong. I'm going to do well. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to progress. Others could have just thought, oh, well, you know, gone home deflated and think, oh, I'm going to look for another job now. Of course, of course. A lot of people, um, you know, do get um, demotivated mm. from the questions like that. You know, is this for you? It can affect people, but it didn't affect you. And, mm. you know, you are where you are today. Um, and yeah, so let's move on from that particular job and tell us what happened after. Where did you go? And yeah, how, you know, how did you get to where you are today? So from there, um, 
a progression. I left the bank after 15 years. Uh, I took a bit of time out because, you know, in those days, gap years weren't as common as they are now, so I hadn't taken a gap year. So I decided that I just wanted to take a break. Um, I was at the time in Madrid. I decided to come back to London and decide what to do. So I spent a bit of time out trying to think about what I wanted to do in life. Um, do I want to go back to Madrid? Do I want to live in London? Do I want to do a different job? So I just was taking my time to decide what I thought was going to be best for me. Um, and then I had, I was reading one day the Evening Standard, and there was an advert there in the business section. And what caught my attention was the name of someone to call. So I called him, and I said, Dennis, is this Dennis that we used to work with? He said, yeah. I said, oh, gosh. So I just saw the advert in the Evening Standard for a company that was called IG Index. Hmm. So he said to me, let's meet. So we met, and he said, look, I'm setting up a foreign exchange desk. Uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm not really doing anything. He said, do you want to join me? He said, well, okay, why not? Something completely different. Mm -hmm. So I thought this could be challenging. So I joined, and I was there for four successful years, built up with um, a really good business. Um, and then I got headhunted. Now, IG, when I left it, was a, f a relatively small company. Relatively small company. Today, it's a FTSE-listed company. Wow. With a market cap in excess of two billion. Okay. So the company's done immensely well mm. in, in its progression in life. So after leaving IG, I had been headhunted by the uh, American investment bank broker called Cantor Fitzgerald. Okay. So after much thought, um, I joined them. Much thought because they're quite a they're quite well known for being quite ruthless. Mm. You know, it's a so take no prisoners, um, but it was an amazing environment, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed. So I was there for just over fif about 15 years. Wow. Um, and thoroughly enjoyed it. I had responsibility for the office in London. I had responsibility for Singapore. So built up a, a, a very successful business there. When I joined them, they were based in the city by Fenchurch Street Station. Uh, and then in 2006... They moved to Canary Wharf. So working in the city, is the stereotype true? I've always wondered, what's it like working in the city? I've never worked in the city. Is that, hold on, is that the stereotype that relates to greed? Greed, <laughs> it's just the whole stereotype of like, you know, how they are as people there in is, the city, how pushy it is. I think, I think it is very much a unique environment compared to any other job, any other sector you could work in because it's aggressive. It's, it has, in certain institutions, there's very much the dog-eat-dog. Dog. There's an expectation of long working hours. And if you, don't, if you are squeamish, if you are a little bit sort of, um, you know, if you don't have a hard skin, you could suffer. You okay. could sort of not enjoy the environment because it, it is a tough world. And, it's, and, you know, there's one common objective, which is make money. And you're expected to make money for the firms. Of course, you are bound by regulations and you have a regulator that oversees you know the business that you do um, but it's yeah it's a very look I've I've met many I've come I've met many um, ex-colleagues so you know you do get but a, a difference of opinion I certainly look back and yeah I can definitely say I enjoyed it and it's not <coughs> it's not about whether you know is it a great place to earn money it's Putting that to one side, is it an enjoyable business? Do you, do you enjoy it? Yes, I did. So, so that I, I, you know, I had to travel a lot. Had met many clients, met many people. Um, you know, this, it was, it was enriching from a life pr perspective. So, what would you recommend for the younger generation if they wanted to get into, for example, and we know you moved into corporate finance later, but but sort of getting into your position, how would you sort of um, advise? Um, and and sort of give them some words of wisdom to get into a position of your status mm. today. Resilience, okay. Hard work, never give up. It's not easy. I mean, it's not a you know you have to find the right institution. Um, sometimes you need to move around. There's many you know many people have moved around, jumped ship, gone to another place, and then moved again. But it's it's a worthwhile career. But it's it's hard work. And it's you have to be resilient, um, and just accept that they are long working hours. 
the, the reward is good if you are successful. Um, and you just need to enjoy it. Unlike anything else, above all, it's what you enjoy. If you do enjoy it, if you're just going to the city because you think, where's the best place I can make money? Well, that's not the good reason. But you need to first of all think, I would like a career in financial services. And if you do want that and you're going to enjoy it, then the success should come if you work hard enough. So it's good for the people out there yeah. who are listening. There's no to magic answer yeah, to say, if you do this, this, you, and this, that's you're it. You're be successful. No. Yeah. So what sort of hours were you working at the beginning in order for you to be in this position? And, and you know, what's the salary expectations for the people out there, people that want to get into your position? You know, like, would you tell them, you know, to take it easy? It, it takes time to get into a position where you're earning hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. Or, you know, you, you know, what's the what's the route? First of all, um, most people these days tend to be graduates. So you need to, depending on what degree you have and what which university, well then, you know, you could possibly apply to, you know, the top tier banks, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, JP Morgan, you know, the big household names. Um, getting in there is all about opportunity, but also there's a bit of luck because you could start at a very junior entry level and you could be working on, say, for example, the bond trading desk as an admin guy or booking tickets. But if you show promise, if you show a degree of wanting to really succeed and get on with the managers and the people that really matter, they might then one day give you a trainee position to start learning how to trade. And that's if you then become successful in trading, that's when the money starts to go up. Okay, you mentioned some big names. I know there's a lot of people out there that would love to work for these companies like the JP Morgans, the Goldsmiths. Um, is there any, do you have any secrets for them? Anything you can let anything any <laughs> advice you can give to them in order for them to get in there um, as a junior as a graduate for them to sort of uh, build up that um, confidence in um, applying or where to apply how to apply just to give them some some you know help really because you know advice yeah. in this is massive you know you know maybe they don't have families for example that can advise them so yeah you know, how well, could having, you advise them having a good education <coughs> is important um, and this case of then sending off your CVs. Now, sometimes you, you might not get into the creme de la creme of the banking world, but there's other banks who are equally as good, who equally offer opportunities, and therefore there's a chance that you can get into one of those. So there's so many, you know, we can talk about HSBC, we can talk about Barclays, we can talk about um, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Swiss Bank Court, there's, you know, there's many institutions out there. Just um, Just going back to when I grew up, my father used to take me um, to Tottenham Court Road when, w w when I first needed a job and he made me hand out CVs. So he made me go into each store and hand out my CVs mm -hmm. every single day till I got a job, which I did get a job on the third day. Would you recommend, would you say that would still work today or would you say it has to be done via email, just keep contacting the companies? As in, is there another way? Because I find, for example, there's thousands of people right now looking for jobs. Yeah. And they're all struggling, to be honest with you. As in, there's a majority of them that are struggling. They can't find their jobs. They can't get in into placements. And... Like, you know, somebody walked in here the other day into, you know, like the shop downstairs and, you know, like, you know, she walked in with a CV. And then that inspired me, to be honest with you, as a director of a company, as being somebody that's employed hundreds of people. I found that a bit, you know, slightly different to receiving hundreds of CVs a day via email. Would you would you recommend there's, there's other ways out there to sort of get these jobs as opposed to just being another CV on an email? Well, the standard, of course, is you have your CV, you do a nice cover letter. That says a lot more about yourself than just the standard, dear sir, madam, please find a touch my CV, blah, blah, blah. So try to make it a bit more interesting because when they read that cover letter, that's where they're likely to gauge more about who you might be. The CV is just facts. Where you're born, what, you, what school you went to, what your qualifications are. But if you write a good cover letter, that could really draw attention to yourself. Be persistent. Send those CVs, either direct or sometimes through an employment agency you can register with. But what's interesting as a complete opposite to that is on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I came across LinkedIn one day and I saw this guy who had been, I think he must have been sending out like hundreds of CVs. And he, in most cases, he wouldn't get a reply. So he thought, well, what am I going to do? So he basically did, um, you know, the sandwich boards? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
He did a sandwich board. I saw that. I think Canary Wharf. It, he did was it in Canary Wharf, and I think he did it outside Liverpool Street and uh, Cannon Street. Yes, yes. That was a very, very impressive. So he wrote a little brief about himself, and he stood there at the peak hour of the morning when <coughs> all the commuters were coming up. up. Yep. He had a CV, and basically saying to anyone, look, I'm looking for a job. And someone took him on. Someone took his CV, and I think he was employed. So I admire that. Mm. Same. Because you can be really demoralized. Mm. Right? When you're sending off hundreds of CVs and some people don't even bother to write back because that's what they tend to do, right? If you are not successful, you won't hear from us kind of attitude. Mm. So, you know, it can be quite demoralizing when you're doing your best, you really want to work, you want to prove to yourself, you want to be able to show an employer that you can be a good employee and you're getting nowhere. Well, then you sometimes have to resort to more desperate measures. Of course. And bring attention to yourself, yeah. which is what I was talking about in terms of the cover letter. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a big door opener. Okay. I remember sometimes getting quite a few CVs, and you know, you just you, you go through the CV, as I said, it's, it's just factual about the person. Mm. But the cover letter sometimes says a lot. Okay. And that sometimes would catch my attention more than the content of the CV. Okay. So I'd also say, for example, as in, like, I receive thousands of CVs, and um, we've got you know, a few people working here at the mm -hmm. moment and we, you know, we can't respond to everybody. So, you know, if anyone's out there that does get demoralized, you know, like demoralized by people not, you know, responding to their CVs, I would say it's never personal. Like meaning, you know, you, you know, you know, they shouldn't feel some type of way just because somebody hasn't responded. You know, people are very busy in business as you, you know, you know, as we know, we don't have time to go for every email, yeah. you know, throughout the day as in we've got now like a disclaimer on the website that states if you send us an email, we'll only get back to you if it's something that either we're going to purchase or we're going to do business with you on or collaborate on or, you know, something we can work with. Otherwise, yeah. we'd spend, to, I'd spend 24 hours a day responding to people, just telling them, oh, unfortunately, you know, we can't work together. Oh, you know, your CV isn't for us. So it's just, a, it's, to, it's to the younger generation um, you know, they shouldn't feel demoralized. And that guy who st stood outside Liverpool Street Station, my father gave me a call, I think that next day. And he said to me, son, have you got a board? I said, what for? He goes, and he sent me um, an article via text with that guy standing outside. Right. And he said, oh yeah, yeah um, your brother's looking for a job and um, um, he's gonna stand outside the station. I said, why? And he said, oh, you know, you know, you know he's gonna do what that guy done because he got a job really quick. So. I said, uh, you know, I said to my dad, Dad, times have changed. It's not like back in the day where you can, you know, you know, you know, you could send your son out there on the road now. But he said, no, but this guy's done it, so Sammy can do it. And my brother's like fourteen. Wow. Yeah. So he's, you know, you know, you know and my father has that uh, mentality of putting things into us and you know making us do things that we would not normally do because you know, as being you know, fourteen, fifteen year old kids, for example, it's not something that we're gonna have inside of us to sort of go out there and 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 right. sort of strive to get a job. But you know. You know, like seeing that young man, even my father called me straight away because he saw something in that. Yeah, looking at that, I would recommend a lot more people um, to do that. I would tell people out there right now, if you're watching this and you're looking for a job in any field, get a board, try it out. There's no one else who's done it after that guy. And now that guy is gone, he's got his job. But there's thousands of people sitting at home right now that haven't got jobs. I think without wanting to be critical, there's a, a robotic approach the job seeking you put your cv together you do the same cover letter it's not personally addressed it's dear sir madam try and find out who is the person you need to really send it to put his name dear mr dear miss dear whatever um it shows you're making an effort sending out lots of cvs and expecting a response is challenging mm -hmm. the hr department is extremely busy mm -hmm. trying to respond to all the people who say sorry but you've not been successful on this occasion blah 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 it's difficult mm -hmm. so it shouldn't be taken personally it shouldn't deflate you but you just need to carry on yeah totally agree let's move on to now let's move on to um something i like talking about yeah business mm -hmm. um maybe we can start with the recession and what we're currently going through and interest rates and what you've seen throughout your life yeah yeah in regards yeah. to this because we've spoken about it you know we've known each other for some time now so mm -hmm. i know tell everybody else about your experiences and the ups and downs and back again throughout the last 30 well, years for example well as you know adam i'm you're not, a, lot, you're a, lot not older than you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more knowledge so I, I think that just brings more experience having seen a lot more but you know we we've gone through you know 15 years of a very low rate 
interest environment. And, and for people that in 2006, 2007, who were looking to get their first mortgages, they were looking at interest rates close to zero. Yes. So therefore, Half a percent the mortgage time. Yeah. was coming out pretty cheap. Very cheap and at that time. Smart people were probably fixing those rates for yep. three or five years. So, so what we see today, however, is that anyone who was, say, 15 or 16 back in 2006, 2007, 15 years later, they're now ready to buy their first home. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they're looking at interest rates at 4%. You know, Bank of England raised them last week. Yep. Uh, is there another raise on the cards? Probably. Mm -hmm. They might peak at 4.5, depending on how the inflation pressures might ease as a result of the increase in interest rates. But, you know, to anyone who took out a mortgage back then at 0% and paying very low, all of a sudden, that fixed rate has expired. They're now having to have a mortgage with an interest rate of above 5%. Mm. That's a big difference. That's a massive difference. And in yeah. terms of how that impacts disposable income, big difference. Mm. So that has an onward effect in terms of everything else, right? Can I afford that extra holiday? Can I afford this? Can I afford that? Because all of a sudden, there's a lot more of my money going towards paying my mortgage. So what would you recommend for the younger generation who haven't bought a house yet that are trying to save a deposit? They've got the money in the bank. Their money in the bank's not making them any more money. Yeah, their parents are telling them, you know, telling them you got to buy a house if they're in that position. They got a deposit of ten or fifteen percent. What are they gonna do? Well, there's there's a silver lining in terms of the interest rates having gone up, which has basically slowed down demand. And slowing down demand means that prices begin to ease a little bit. So it's expected that house prices will start to fall. Um, that would help, obviously, the 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 first time buyer to buy the new home if they've got a decent deposit. But of course, what it all boils down to afterwards is the the cost of having that mortgage. Because interest rates at 5%, sorry, mortgage rates at around 5, 5.5% becomes quite a you know, significant part of your monthly expenditure. So tell everybody about the interest rates 20 years ago. Explain well, to them I'll, about I'll go, what really happened. I'll go further back. So I remember back in, I hope I get my years right, but in back in 1997, when there was a run on the pound. Now, yep. for anyone who might know or might remember, there was this gentleman called George Soros okay. who decided to bet against the pound. So he was selling the pound as if it was going out of fashion. The Bank of England normally intervenes to stop the slide, but they couldn't do anything. Such was the power of George Soros and the rest of the market that decided to follow him the downward pressure was significant. So what did the Bank of England do in order to stop the slide of the value of the pound? They raised interest rates and they went up to 15%. Wow. One five. So what did people do? How did they survive? They panicked. <laughs> they panicked. <laughs> I guess they thought, oh my God, what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. Like interest rates at 15%. Sell. Like, significant. <laughs> like, it's just a horrid time. It was a horrid time. 2008, we had what's called as the credit crunch. So the credit crunch basically involved banks who had basically over leveraged their balance sheet. Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, frivolous lending might not be too much of a loose word to use. So, you know, at the time there was a building society called Northern Rock. Okay. And I Northern that. Rock were giving out a hundred percent mortgages. Wow. So basically, they were just giving up money. Yeah. They were just giving up money. And that's unsustainable mm. because we had the, the, the contagion of what occurred in the US with mortgages which are known as subprime. Mm. And subprime mortgages are those given to people who are, have the worst credit profile. And there were mortgages called Ninja. Ninja standing for no income, no job applicants wow and i read stories of a guy in prison in oklahoma who managed to get a mortgage <laughs> for his mum to buy a home that's how much that's the whole awesome. thing was yeah. out of control so they packaged up all these mortgages they were they were sold as a bond and people and the banks would buy them and trade them but they were just ticking time bombs waiting to explode so it caused the collapse of lehman brothers which was the biggest, ca you know, the biggest casualty of the credit crunch. So you know we've seen we've seen those volatilities, vol markets going up and down. You know, 
they were let it go. And uh, yeah, it's it's it wasn't good. It's not a good sign. So what would you advise uh, before the younger generation today? Should they buy or should they not buy a house? If example, they've got a salary between husband and wife of around, say most people get between 50 and 80,000 pounds a year. So you're looking at about 100 and 140, for example, mm. um, thousand, you know, as an income together, they're trying to buy a house for a million pound. Well, we all know historically that, you know, you take out a mortgage for say 25 years, maybe even 30 years. Um, it's your, it's the biggest part of your expense. But we also know that historically, property prices in the UK always go up. You have the cycles where you have these, you know, um, stormy times when markets react, uh, interest rates go up, you have to tighten the belt. You know, we have a mo at the moment the, ca the crisis surrounding energy prices. Mm -hmm. But overall, you know, you're sitting on an asset that appreciates. So I guess it's really, you know, you want to buy your first home, you want to own a home, you don't want to rent and make the landlord happy. Mm -hmm. You're basically going to just, you know, make that sacrifice, get a good deposit, find the best rates, take a view as to whether should I fix my mortgage rate for a period of time so that I know for the next three or five years exactly what my monthly outgoing is going to be and work hard. Okay. Would you, what would you consider a good deposit on... A million pound house for someone. Well, this is more a question that relates to what a lender is prepared to advance. Okay. So, you know, lenders tend to look at a property depending on where the property is located, uh, look at the applicants, and then consider a loan to value of X. So typically on a million pound house, what would they expect? Well, you know, if you are able to show a combined salary of X that they then give a multiple loan on Times four, to I that. think it is at the moment. I think it's about four, yeah, about times four. four. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a combined income between husband and wife of, I don't know, 200,000, then yep. they could probably lend you 800,000. Right? Yeah. So you think, okay, well, I've got I've got to sort of bridge the gap of 200,000, which if I'm selling a previous home, I might have the free equity or I might have the money available. So it's all it's all very much it's down all very, on, yeah. on, a, on, a, on an equation. Yeah. It's a formula. I know a lot about the properties, to be honest mm. with you. It's just about the people who are, who who really can't get on the ladder because I've got a lot of friends with money yeah. in the bank they can't get on and also now they're thinking, you know, you know they don't have salaries of two hundred thousand pounds a year. The people that I grew up with they don't have that salary. So now, you know, the property prices have gone up so much over the past ten years because I remember when I bought what, what was it, a house 14, 15 years ago, uh, which was in Wood Green, Bounds Green Road. It was two hundred and forty nine thousand pounds. <laughs> it was under stamp duty. Got it out of the auction. It was run down, spent 30, 40,000 on it, sold it about a year and a half later for half a million. Those days are not here anymore. I've realized that, I mean, that house now is up for sale for a million pounds, but it's it's 15 years ago. So my friends who are now looking at those houses or even smaller houses, they just can't see value for money in buying, for example, you know, you know, you know, you know they're looking at nothing wrong with ex-local authorities. And they're looking at one, two bedroom flats in an ex-local property in... Stanford, Hillstock, Newington, yeah. and then <clears throat> and they are now three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand pounds, but they want a house. When I when I bought my first property, it was a studio flat. Okay, I had a small deposit, and my salary allowed me to get a mortgage. And then I sold that after a year. I made a good profit. I then bought my next one. Yes, but the difference was that in those days there was a correlation between property prices and salary, where today that gap has widened so much. Mm -hmm. And we're not just talking about central London, you know, people can talk about the wealthy Russians, the wealthy Chinese, the wealthy Indians, the Middle East that come into central London and push up property prices in Knightsbridge, Kensington, Mayfair. But if you go outside of London, the typical suburbs outside of London, whether it's north, south, east, south, those prices have rocketed. Mm. And they've rocketed to a point where even, you know, a, an above average salary mm. for someone putting down a deposit for the first time. You know, a first bedroom flat, one bedroom flat, sorry, in, in a suburb could cost, what, 350? Wow. For example. Yeah. Um, if you have to put down at least maybe 10%, if you can get away with 10%, mm. that's 35,000 pounds. Mm. If you have no one to help you, like your parents can't help you, you know, how long will it take you to save 35,000 pounds? Of course. In yeah. order to get, and by the time you get there, the, the price has gone, gone up, up and then so you, you're, you're just chasing. Yeah. Right? You just keep chasing all the time. And that's where the problem is. It's, I think it's unsustainable. Right? Mm. A first-time buyer cannot buy 
for the first time unless he says or payments come up mm -hmm. give him some money that's it yeah or they might buy together you know they might just find someone that they can buy together with but otherwise it's it's very difficult mm. so you know you end up with a lot of rentals that's what that's what we've seen at the moment a lot of people can't afford a lot of people are renting all the properties as in you know we were yeah. lucky enough to be in a position to buy the properties but now it's just you can see that yeah if you look at yeah. sort of if you were to do a, a percentage increase of say for example when i bought for the first time which was in well, i'm giving giving a lot away here when i bought for the first time in 19 1985 bloody hell. 1985 bloody hell charles if you I look born at in 1986 <laughs> <laughs> the average the percentage increase of salaries from back then to today versus the percentage increase of the properties an average property back mm. then to today is just like just off the charts otherwise somebody on like 20 30 that 20,000 then would be on 150,000 now and now yeah, they're in yeah yeah and now they're on 35,000 for example yeah it's, it's just like a control. teacher for example like a yeah. teacher but you can't you can't question you know certain areas so you know that the Mayfairs and the Knightsbridge those it's are completely different it's a completely yep. different different okay. property market mm -hmm. i would call it a, a separate secondary property market that's more unique for certain buyers mm. but for the average person it's impossible so let's talk about people that are wanting to start businesses this environment 2023 you've got a lot of people looking to sort of jump into business new startups what advice would you give people now that want to start businesses What's your opinion on that? I have a massive opinion on business. I know what I would do. You know, I'm a big risk taker. So, you know, I'm all, you know, like I'm not, you know, even the recession has hit, people are very worried right now. I can see people are not wanting to spend. Um, you know, people who are spending are waiting for the, the, the interest rates to go even higher. People are selling. The property prices have dropped. So they've got money in the bank. It's a time mm. to spend. People who have got very, you know, a lot of money in the bank are going to be buying a lot of properties now. It's a great time for some people to, you know, like to yeah. spend. And then for others that are not in that position, what are they going to do? If, for example, they want to start a business, they want to make some money, they're fed up of working on a, you know, like 20, 30,000 pound a year salary. What will they do, Charles? Tell them. There's no easy answer to that because if you want to be entrepreneurial, so if you decide that, you know, you become an employee, you become robotic in your life to the extent that Monday to Friday, you go and do your job, you get paid, you hope for you hope for progression, you hope to then get promoted, you hope to earn more money. But for some people, that doesn't work for them. So for some people, they want to be their own boss. They have a good business idea, they have a concept, they want they want to develop something. So they start a business, they start a small company. Those early beginnings of any new business are very challenging because you need to worry about cash flow. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to sort of uh, find your marketplace. You need to look at your competition. You need to stand out. So it, it takes a, a huge amount of hard work. And it's a big risk because I've, I've known, I know people and I'm, there's one company at the moment that I'm working with who the guy left his very steady job working for a bank. Um, but he was, he had a very strong conviction about doing something with his technology know-how and expertise. So he started a company and the company so far doing immensely well. But in the early days, yeah. of course, it was a risk. All of a sudden, when you're used to having that paycheck go into your bank account every month, and all of a sudden that stopped. Yes. And you're not generating any revenue because your business is still at a very embryonic stage. Mm -hmm. You know, people panic about things like that. But again, it's like everything else in life, if you persevere, if you really strongly believe in what you want to do, and you believe in your product, and you would think you you know you have that really strong conviction in your heart that you're going to make it work and you can be successful. That's what it is. It's a rocky road. It can be rough patches. It can be desperation at times, but you know eventually you get to the finishing line. Mm. But many, you know, the truth is though, you know, let's put this into perspective. The reality is that most startups fail mm. very quickly. I haven't gone into any detail as to why that is. Is it related to? cash flow they can't meet the expenses they can't survive or is it because the concept of what they're trying to do is wrong has it not been thought about good enough is the business plan not the right business plan but the reality is that most early startups fail very quickly so i, I mean like from me thinking about that i would consider it to be like from you know it could, it could be a possible even lack of experience you know 
for mm. me personally, I find a lot of people that I know have started businesses that haven't succeeded. They haven't really had the mentor, people around them to sort of train them, you know, like for them to be given that knowledge, you know, I feel very blessed to have yeah. a, a, you know, a business father who's just, you know, been on it, that, you know, for his whole life. And for me, it's like, oh, wow, I know how to and do that. And that's a good mentor, right? I, yeah, I know how to do that. You know, oh, that's easy now because I've seen him do that and make the mistakes. And yeah, so, you know, you know, I, you know, I feel if you want to start a business, me personally, I would say find someone that you can talk to. People Definitely. always do these, you know, people have baby showers. I was talking about this to someone recently. I spoke about it to a couple of people. I've said, when you start a business, have a business shower. That's a really good concept. Yeah. So, you know, we get together, you know, you know, you've got like 10 people in a room. We're all business people. We're all successful. Someone's having a startup. They've got an idea. When 10 successful business or nine successful business people sit in a room together, I guarantee you, if they give you just that little bit, it's going to help your business. Because I know if you sat with me in a room, I'd give you something very easily. Any business. It could be any business. I've always got something to say. And it's always going to be what's best for the person and their business and their model. I have to understand what they're talking about, but I will, you know, get around it and understand and give them what they, what I feel they need to succeed in their model. So this technology company that I, that I briefly mentioned and the guy had left his very comfortable job in the bank. So he started this company. It's been going now for five years, but you know, it started to really propel in the last year and a half or so. And I was introduced to them last year because they were looking to create an advisory panel. It's a good idea. Just yeah, just advice. All the way. And there's four of us from different walks of life, right? And we basically advise. Mm. So he might say, "Oh, what do you think of this contract? What do you think about this?" We we just basically he's he's someone that he can turn to, and just to send out an idea. And he's the final decision maker, mm. and we are just there to give an opinion and say, "Oh, have you looked at this? Or have you looked at it from this other perspective?" It just gives you a greater enlightenment when you're thinking about some important decisions you need to make. And I think that's, you know, and it works well for him. Mm. You know, most other companies usually would have a board. Yeah. So they have a board. The board convenes. They get together. They dis they discuss things. But this is quite different because we are not attached to the company. Yeah. So we're just there as an advisory panel. So, uh, Charles, essentially, what you do is raise capital for startups. It's not quite. Um, it's not quite raising capital for startups. It's basically helping the entrepreneur. Okay. Find someone mm -hmm. who could be an angel investor, who would like the concept of the business that they have, and basically joining them together. Okay. Is it? So with the investor, is it is it a profit share or is it a silent partner in a business? How does that work? Each investor is different. So depending on the nature of the business, depending more on the nature of the investor, he may want to have a more ongoing involvement with the business as opposed to just putting the money in. Mm -hmm. So there was one instance um, recently where the guy made the investment, but he wanted one of his key men to be on the board. Mm -hmm. So more for everything than oversight, see how they're progressing, see how they're getting on with the business. Because, of course, he's got an amount invested. Mm. So he felt comfortable having somebody there. Um, on other occasions, there might be someone who likes the concept, likes the people who are running it, believes in them, has no issues. and They make the investment and just leave them to it. They'll get, you know, updates on how the business is progressing. Um, but they are at arm's length. And what sort of um, capital have you raised for someone? What's the most? It it varies. Look, I mean, there, there's um, for me, it's not so much the amount. For me, there's a greater satisfaction if I happen to introduce someone who gets the investment okay. from that potential introduction. And because of the nature of the person, the nature of the business, um, it, that's very satisfying. I mean, there was one last year where these two very creative individuals um, had this concept to help children learn, and they created this concept called Thingosaurus, mm. which, by virtue of the name, involves dinosaurs. And I, I really liked that one, maybe because I have my own child, and uh, I particularly liked what they were doing. I thought it was going to be hugely successful. Um, 
and they think they can turn it into a Peppa Pig. Wow. And, you know, for those who know or don't know, Peppa Pig turned into a significant, valuable franchise mm. from from what was its original inception. Let's go back to uh, the point that I was making or that people out there want to know and hear about their new businesses, their startups. How are they, how easy or how hard is it for them to get money for their new business? The answer, Adam, is quite simple. It's not easy. You know, any any would-be entrepreneur who has a business idea really needs to put in a lot of work into the research, into the marketplace, into the competition. Um, the financial forecast critical to make sure that you know the business can be sustained while it's growing. Um, I read into um, quite interesting that recently a guy who had a job. He wanted to start a business. He had his flat. He had a decent amount of equity and he needed money. But he was so adamant about the success of his business that he believed in. He sold the flat, wow. took the equity, moved him back with his parents, used that equity to launch his business. Wow. Because he would find it immensely difficult. You know, if you go to the bank and say, I want to borrow you know, 25K, 50K, mm. 100K, 250 and have this business, the banks are likely to just look at you sympathetically and say, come back when you've got positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. Or when you, when we can see numbers that really stack up that would give us the belief and the comfort that we can lend you the money. So you get angel investors. Yeah. Angel investors, by virtue of the name, mm -hmm. are people that basically are more sympathetic, allegedly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they all ultimately, um, they're not a charity. Yeah. So we mustn't think of an angel investor as a charity. They want their pound of flesh. They want the return. They want to believe that this business could succeed because, you know, they're investing in it. But, you know, it does boil down to the nature of the business, but also, very importantly, the person. The person can make all the difference. So the person that sold his house, was he successful? He was. He was good. Okay, that's a good story then. And that's, that's the self-belief that yeah. uh, I talk about so often in terms of, whether you're applying for a job, once you get a job, how you have to, you know, persevere and believe in yourself. This is the same. You know, he believed in 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 this business idea. He believed that this was going to be better for him than doing his day to day job, getting paid monthly, paying his mortgage and progressing in life in that way. So he really did believe that his business would launch, would be successful, and he took the risk and the risk paid off. So let's go back to raising capital if um, you know, if you're in a position um, where you're starting a business and and you have an opportunity to raise capital, would you recommend raising capital or not raising capital? As in, as in, I believe in raising capital because I believe it's a good debt. Um, it's not for everybody. Um, it's just a question that somebody, yeah. you know, you know, told me to ask. For example, you know, you know, like, you know, like yourself, you know, to ask you uh, to see if you know, you know, in your belief in. Capital. Well, working capital is essential because until you get to a point where whatever product or service you are selling brings in so much revenue that it's everything paid for itself and you're making a profit. But at that early stage, working capital is exactly to help you get to that. So you need that financial help, whether it's to cover premises, whether it's to cover employee costs, uh, innovation, development, growth, sales, marketing, all of that is part of the business growth. So until you get to that point, um, or that momentum gets to a point where you've now generated revenues, where you are cash positive every month, and then you can sort of, not so much relax, but you think, right, I've got here, I've got this as an important stage, now I've got to. So what if they're a business that keeps expanding? As you know, you, 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 you know, some businesses start off, they're making money. Yeah. So, you know, they're in positive equity. Um, they want to continue. They want to keep going and keep and going and keep going. And they continue to raise yeah. capital. Like, for example, a firm might be successful, has been established, well-known, generating profits, but then there's an opportunity to grow. Mm. And that opportunity comes around from making an acquisition. Yes. But making an acquisition mm -hmm. can be a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So they go and raise the money. So let's talk about your profession. We're going to go back a bit. What has it taught you over the years? You've given everyone a you know, great advice on business. You know, we've talked, we spoke about good debt, good debt, bad debt, uh, raising capital, property, you know, like, you know, like we haven't spoken about the recession, but we know about of the recessions that have happened. Tell the viewers what your profession has taught you over the years. It involved a lot of hard work. 
it involved a lot of sacrifice, but at the same time, it was a great life experience. It was a really good journey for me. I enjoyed every single day. Mm. Obviously, some days are not so good, and some days are can be quite deflating. But overall, uh, I really enjoyed it. And you know, it's 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 learning a lot about people as well. This is very much a people business because when you're dealing with private clients. Um, no one single private wealthy client is the same. Mm. Different backgrounds, different outlooks on life. What it's taught me, has it taught me to be uh, prudent with money? Yes, maybe no. <laughs> but I've, I've just enjoyed the, I've just enjoyed the whole journey. It's good. Yeah. You've had a good journey, you've had a good run. Mm -hmm. So Adam, have you found, um, you know, running your business, looking to expand um, other projects in terms of raising capital have you found that quite daunting easy what's your ex what's your own experience so my experience on raising capital as in i i have nothing against raising capital and using that to sort of progress in the businesses but um i, I feel as if though i've been lucky enough to not need the capital so i've sort of had uh with the growth with with like the majority of the businesses i had back up so, you know, like my father was involved or I had a partnership within a business and there was always money there. Mm -hmm. So I never needed to raise capital with, for example, the new lo love luxury business. You need a lot of money as in you're just pumping into stock all the time. You're giving out money. You know, you, you know, money's always out. So, you know, you know, it, it usually just ends up coming from my personal bank account, to be honest with you. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm forever putting money from my personal back into the business. It keeps going into the business, but that's how the business is building. And, 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 you know, I'm, I'm in a position where I can do that, but I don't enjoy doing that, to be honest with you. I want the business to sort of um, succeed on its own two feet. You know, you know, it's making money, it's a profitable business, and that gets reinvested back into the business. And I can feel it needs more and more and more. So I'm feeding the business. I feel like it, it, it's my new baby. I haven't really um, raised any capital because I just feel if I go to the banks, I probably can raise money. You know, when they sort of, you know, you, you, you know, you know, you know, check what we've done, they can see how much money we're turning over, how much profit we're making. I feel it's not going to be um, a very hard task for me to go to the bank and, and raise some money. I just don't think it's going to be enough. I don't yeah. think I'm going to get the money that I really want because because what I'm going to want and what I'm going to be asking for, they're going to think this guy's bonkers. He's he's lost it a little bit. I mean, I I've seen um I've seen sort of various points of view that small businesses where they're looking to expand or you know they need to sort of cover some short term cash liquidity issues they go to the bank and the banks have become quite unsympathetic yeah and you know they want to you know you ask them to entertain an application because you need to borrow 20,000 50 100 and it goes through sort of all these different stakes checks, yeah checks uh, yeah. whatever um, and it's it, it can be distressing for a small business yeah for me it's like if some i mean you know if i went to the bank and said i need 300 grand it'll be one watch Right. <laughs> yeah, so it's here you go. <laughs> yeah, here you go. Yeah, so it's coming to my bank. I have bought a watch with it, and it's it's just sitting as um a stock as profit. And um, you know, you know, eventually we sold it, and it just keeps happening again and again. So with one watch in the window, for the but amount of money, you know, because obviously that's you know that's what they're you know at the moment they're they're, they're a bit worried of um you know giving out. But imagine these a, new businesses. Imagine money. a situation where you needed I don't know, a quarter of a million. Yeah, for whatever reason, and you think God, I need a quarter of a million. So I'm going to go to the bank. I'm going to carry this beautiful watch in a beautiful box and say, I need to go a quarter of a million. And they're going to say, mm. okay, how are you going to secure it? You mm. know, what's my security? Well, here's a watch. It's worth 300,000. Do you think they would say, okay? I mean, if I was a bank, I'd say definitely. You would think so, right? Yeah, I would take it if but I was a bank. I don't think the banks would do it. No, I don't think they're interested. No. Yeah. I mean, like they're going to want, for example, you know, you know, one of the properties. You know, you're gonna say, okay, they'll take a yeah. first charge, take, take a, a second charge. charge. Yep, that's it. But if you say, here's a watch, you think, well, what should I help? What do we do? <laughs> they won't do <laughs> the watch. In the save. Mm. How do I document mm. this security that allows me to sell it? Oh, and how does a bank actually then go about selling, selling it? Mm. Does it take it to an auction? So you know, you have a, an amazing asset, mm. a great value of security that you can offer, but would the banks entertain it? No, no. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, I've always looked into it. Um, I've just been lucky enough to have people around me um, that are extremely successful. So, so if I'm if I've ever needed them, if I'm ever short, I'm sure there's probably some 
what's called asset backed lending. Yeah. So lending against an asset. Against an asset, yeah. And you might say, hey, I've got a, I've got a Picasso. Yeah. Take it, put it in the safe, and you know, haircut it. So if it's worth a hundred million, I just want twenty. So you've got plenty of security. Mm -hmm. So asset backed lending could be uh, something out of the norm that perhaps the banks won't do so much. We're not giving any, um, any of our painters up just yet. <laughs> yeah. Keep them in the safe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah. So in so notwithstanding the success of your own businesses, Adam, have you ever? Had anyone come to you and say, look, Adam, I've got a great business. I need some investment. Have you ever considered that? Or would you consider that? So I've had multiple partners mm -hmm. in businesses um, that we've like invested both of our money. So I've had five or I think five or six partners. I can't remember. Um, and I've invested in their ideas. Right. In, yeah, including, um, you know, an idea where we've sat together and I've improved on the idea where I felt as if I've, I've improved on the ideas. Um, and I felt as if though it doesn't work for me. I can't work with someone. I've realized that I, I don't need a partner in business. With me as a business person, I'm so strong um, in my beliefs and thoughts that I find it really difficult to work with other people because they have an idea. Yeah. And, and I, not in a bad way, but I feel as if though I've got more experience in business. So they say something that sounds ridiculous to me. <laughs> and it's like- So you need to be hands on uh, and yeah. be able to have a say in what they want to do and what decisions they make before you think, well, if I'm going to put money in, I can't just be at arm's length, walk away and- Good luck. Of someone who doesn't have the experience because right. the people that I was working with were new business people. Yeah. So we were, you know, we grew up together in an area. So they were my friends of similar age, but my background was completely different to this. So I had someone, I had, I had a mentor when they didn't have the mentor. So they thought, oh, they've got a great idea. I believed in the idea, but I felt as if though it needs like tweaking. So we need to do this and this and this in order for it to work. And they'd go, no, 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 we need to do it this way. And I've said, no, nah, it's not for me, mate. Yeah, but we've invested money into the ideas. I think we, you know, I think, and you know, I've ended up I've ended up losing hundreds of thousands, or you know, you know, of pounds investing in people, in businesses, in ideas that haven't made any money. You know, a lot of people would probably feel some type of way when they're losing that much money. For me, it was just it's always been a game. And you know, when I've invested hundreds of thousands of pounds, or, or it was thirty thousand, twenty thousand, fifty thousand, eighty thousand, again and again and again, yeah. my wife knows me as a person. I don't, you know, I never had an issue with losing that money because I always felt as if though if I don't do this, I would never know. Yeah, and that was my sort of way of 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 un, you know like some people go casino. They will spend hundreds of thousands in the <laughs> casino, you know, and then to me that was bonkers. And I'd spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on businesses, but I would be more happy to yeah. spend it on a business that didn't succeed than just lose it in the casino. Yeah, so, it is, um, it that, is. that was my understanding. Yeah, that was me giving myself the um you know you know the um, the understanding of it's all right, it's not a problem, it's just money. And 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 you know I've learned something from this. What I have learned is that's not going to be successful. Mm. Don't put any more money into it. So you take an informed and calculated risk. Mm. And of course there's no guarantees. No guarantees. You in believe business. in the guy, you believe in what they're doing and you know it is a case of whether it's going to succeed or not. Yeah, I sometimes yeah, it does it, uh, businesses do fail. And it is what it is. I mean, that, yeah. When when we've had, the, I mean, when I've invested in the businesses and the people, there there have been successful businesses from the ideas, but it just didn't it didn't suit me at the time. As in, as, as I felt as if though there wasn't enough money in the pot for me to continue to do those businesses, right. because you know I felt you know I'm a lot better than that, and I felt I could do a lot better and I can make more money. So, so when a business did succeed, how did it make you feel? I want to do another business. <laughs> I woke up, you know, right, so I'm a good hungry feel. for more business. Yeah, I want to invest that in what so I So you believed in the guy, you put believe, some money in, uh, yep. he's, he's been successful, good feel factor. Yeah, and then reinvest the money straight away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that money goes back into something exactly. that makes more money and more money. And, and you know, at the end of the day, we need passive income. You know, you, yeah. we've got the properties for the capital gain. Um, and, and yeah, we, you know, we look for certain investments that keep making us money because the money in the bank's no good. You know, I'm, I'm a type of person that, that I hate having money in my bank. If I've got money in the bank, I feel as if though I'm poor. On that basis, what's your thoughts on crypto? So me and crypto Something as Something we've never talked about, so I thought yeah, this yeah, is about about opportunity. The, yeah, about the blockchain, the crypto. Hmm. I was yeah, I actually had a meeting today at four thirty or five thirty, um and with someone that's um um producing a metaverse. Right. So yeah, uh, you, you know it's their own platform. Um, I've got my own NFT, uh, NFTs coming out soon. So you know I haven't told anybody yet, to be honest with you. So maybe I have to edit this out. Yeah, <laughs> but I've got a couple of um, bits in the pipeline in regards to NFTs. I believe in NFTs, as in that there is a project at the moment that I'm not going to go too deep into. Okay. But, um, but I do have belief in the project, and I am looking into it at the moment, and I'm working with a couple of people that I've worked with over the past three years that work for me, um, and they're working on projects that I'm getting into at the moment. 
And my belief for that particular, um, you know, for the NFTs is, I don't want to go too deep into it. It's just because I'm going to give my secrets up, not in a bad way. I'm just, I'm just in the process right now. We take this one offline. Yeah, we take it <laughs> offline at the moment. We can put it in, but we're not going to tell them the actual secrets of the new project um, yeah. until it's live. I have, um, I have a view. So crypto came around after the credit crunch. Yep. So it came around around 2008. It didn't take long for anyone who even had no finance experience, no investment experience, not even buying shares in any company. And then all of a sudden crypto arrived and it was just like an explosion. And everyone suddenly thought, I'm going to make so much money. People were taking out loans and borrowing money and getting into crypto. But for me, what I struggled with is the lack of transparency yeah. that exists. That what's behind it? Who's behind this? Mm. Allegedly, if you if you believe what how crypto was born, it was some Japanese guy mm -hmm. who apparently created twenty million coins, mm -hmm. and from that here we have this huge interest in crypto, and everyone's got involved in crypto. But of course, you know we've seen the volatility yeah. of crypto. We've seen how. You know, you could get in at different levels and before you know it, the whole thing has dropped 20%. <laughs> yeah. And you think, oh my God. Um, and then, of course, the latest was regarding the guy, Sam Bankman. Hyde. The scandal, yeah. Uh, Crazy. So, and that straight away should be a real eye open for people. You know, I wonder how he got away with that. Scandals exist in, in yeah. listed companies where yeah. it's an accounting fraud. I mean, I could tell you about three or four in recent times. But, you know... Crypto is one that everyone was involved with. Yeah. Everyone knew about, talked about, wanted to get involved with. Um, and I think it's even make, it makes people dangerous. It's because, you know, you know, we trusted, you know, putting our money into a company that yeah. were not using the money for the right purpose. And they were taking the money out. They, they were reinvesting it without, you know, like the customers knowing. Yes. FTX, yeah, that's it. That's what so it this is the guy that was at one point worth... Billion. According to Forbes, yeah. was worth about twenty billion. I th and now yeah. he's, uh, you know, his parents had to find some money to get him bail. Where did he go? Did he go to like, the Maldives? Did he just leave? He went to, money? I can't remember if it was Bahamas or Bermuda. Okay, we get the two mixed up. But he's like one or the other. He got extradited. Went to the US. He's now, I don't, I think he got parole. Mm. So I think he's he was let out on parole, but he's potentially facing, you know, a lengthy jail time. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I find it quite sad when, you know, when these things happen because, you know, a lot of people entrust their money. A lot of people, you know, put in life savings, yeah. remortgage, um, in good faith. Right? They, the guy had a reputation. No one thought there was anything untoward. And now they find themselves probably unable to recover anything. Mm. And disaster. And it gives, you know, it, it brings about a bad reputation. Right? It brings about that fear of mistrust. Yeah, so yeah, I totally agree. Bad credibility. So I had a mate, or well, I have a mate. Um, he's a very good friend. He comes here a lot, and he invested not only his money, but other people's money, in into FTX. It was around one point two million that he had in his account, um, in like pound worth, mm -hmm. um, and and he tried to withdraw it when he found out that they were going bankrupt. And he didn't get any of his money back. And he was in the sh he was in my shop. He came to the shop to speak to me. He asked me, you know, he's panicking. He's like, I'm trying to get the money. I'm trying to get the money out. So we went on onto his account on his phone. He withdrew the money, and he was with somebody that was like an advisor that said, Oh, we'd have to wait a couple of days. It will be in the account, be in the account. He said, Adam, what do you think is gonna happen? What do you think is gonna happen? I said, I haven't got a clue. Horrendous. I said, I haven't got a clue. And he, to be honest with you. He he doesn't have that much money, so I think you know I think he he you know he may have, you know, a couple of million in investments, and he has a couple of million in in stocks and bonds, and he and he's got a couple of people. You know, he's buying a new house in London, which is a couple of million pounds. But that was like a, that was his savings, that was just his like you know like his play money. It's a huge dent. It's right? a massive dent, and he was um, you know you know I th you know you know I saw him a couple of weeks back, and and he still hasn't recovered. But not only hasn't he recovered, it's he's invested other people's money as well. So yeah. you know he invested like two hundred thousand of someone else's money, three hundred thousand there as well. So he people had given him money because they trust him because he's a very trustworthy person. But the problem now is he just feels he feels like you know 
even though it's not his fault, it's not his fault, it's wrong, nothing to do with him. But the fact that it all went by him. That's it. So now he. Yeah. Yeah, had he, he told them, look, I'm doing this, it's mm. up to you, and they did it, then. Yeah, it's a bit different. You shouldn't yeah. feel so bad. But of course, having done it by him. He now owes the money, which is. Horrible he's, situation. I mean, he paid them back straight away because he had money in his other, you know, he, in his UK account. So I've seen that he spent. He, now he's sort of like, you know, he's dried up his accounts. So he's probably around 1.7 million down very quickly. And yeah. that. And that to him, I feel as if that was his full year's worth of money that he worked for, and and you know it. I mean, I mean it's it's a tough year because he had a really good year. That was a very good year because he's built up to this position, and this year mm. the momentum isn't there anymore. I felt as if though he's he's sort of like you know he's 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 lost that sort of um, will to work this year. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I've seen it firsthand. So for me, um, you know, I've seen what what it can do to someone. And he's a very strong person, but I just, it's just, you know, it is what it is. So, you know, you know, we went into talking about crypto. You mentioned NFTs is what I am now looking into or doing some work um, with other people. What's your opinion on NFTs? Honestly? Honestly. I have zero. <laughs> zero. <is n> <laughs> I'm actually keep me to, and this has been going on for such a long time now, but I keep me to... Okay, I really need to understand NFT. You need to understand non fungible tokens. Tokens, yeah. Right? <laughs> and I think, what does it mean? That someone creates some kind of artwork and exactly. turns it into an NFT. Yep. And it has a value. Yep. Why? So I think to myself, why? So, so how about the P so how about the Monet? How about if we made the Monet into NFT? So now, um, you know, you know, um my father's an art collector. So yeah. he has a lot of art. So he's been um so you could you could do an, an NFT collection the based art, on, his on his art, but then yeah. it's only you know you can't do an NFT on, for example, your watch because there's a thousand you know there's the you know it's got to be multi, unique, right? It's got to be unique. Yeah. So you know you know you, you know you know hundred hundreds of thousands of people may have the same model, but if you've got one piece of art, it's you know you know no one's got another one. It's unique to you. You make an NFT, an NFT for like a Monet or a Picasso is selling more than the actual art itself. Really? Yeah. So if you have a, a limited edition of something yeah or one of 10 one of 100 or does it have to be the only one the only one it has to be a unique it has to be one, unique because, because yeah otherwise you can have multiple versions of the nft right, so somebody could copy you yeah and do the same thing so exactly. if you have a so like a monet painting of something is unique you have yeah. done the same one so you can turn that into an nft and what why how would it sell how do, what value, so what value do you put on it i mean i don't know the value but I've seen, you know, a piece of art that sold, that sells for hundred million, so and yeah. hundred million the art sells for as an NFT selling for two hundred and fifty million. But if you're if you're an artist, you not 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 Monet or Picasso or anyone, you happen to just be artistic and you create something and turn it into an NFT. Is that do people do that as well? Or? Of course, you could turn anything. I mean, can you do your own NFT? Yeah, I'm turning myself into NFT. Because you are unique. Yeah, <laughs> unique. <laughs> it's only one of me. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> As we're not going to go too deep into the NFT projects at the moment, but yeah. Um, so let's go. I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question mm. because I know you're a very busy person. Thank you. Um, so what are your hopes and goals for the near or distant future? Well, I'm working on three projects at the moment, which are quite big and quite important. Um, I can't really disclose anything in terms of detail, but there's still that good feeling yeah. when a project comes to a conclusion because it's been a build up over a period of time and you really work hard towards it. Um, and when the project becomes successful and launches, there's a huge amount of satisfaction. Of course, there's rewards that follow, but there's a great satisfaction in getting a deal done. Mm. So there's, there's a three or four projects at the moment which are in the making. Good, good. I know so those projects. We're not going to tell I anyone think, else I think, out there. Yeah, I think there's one or two yeah. I might have mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, but, uh, I'm yeah. looking forward to Charles <laughs> yeah. getting those numbers. Yeah, <laughs> Let's not exactly. mention any big numbers exactly. here. Exactly, that's a celebration <laughs> thing. Yeah. We're going to put um, a big sign of the of the actual number we're talking about. But, you know, getting, <laughs> getting a deal done is satisfying. There's a, there's a, there's a, it's like the personal achievement feeling. Yeah. That you've achieved this, you've done this. Especially when you're making millions out of it. <laughs> <laughs> we love that achievement, Charles. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But yeah, there's, um, and I think a few holidays as well. Yeah, I think we both Definitely. need a few holidays yeah. now. Definitely. Definitely, yeah. <laughs>
But yeah, Charles, I appreciate you coming on today. No, you're welcome. It's always good to see you. Always, yeah. always fun. Likewise, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, f- you know, I feel as if though we got to have a catch up in in six months or a year from now, mm-hmm. um, and we can look back at this and sort of that talk would about be good, yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll talk how about things have, have changed, have progressed, exactly, yeah, or or not progressed. Um, in or not, yeah. Or well, not. Let's hope. Let's, let's hope, hope it's it all a positive on. progress. And yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you're it. You're very welcome. Glad so, to be here. Guys, this is the end of um, episode three. We appreciate you watching. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did like this, please do subscribe, like, and comment. Give your comments below because we are looking for, like, you know, questions you guys need answered and anything you guys need to know, please let us know. You know, we do do, um, you know, we have private times with Charles here, with myself, and with anybody else that's on the show. If you'd like to meet us, please let us know. We look forward to seeing you guys again. Thank you so much for watching the show and we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.